Thank you, Craig. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. And as you all know, we've been going through the book of Hebrews. And um, it's, a, it's a challenge. I'll be the first to admit, I don't have a, a complete grasp on it. But, but that's why we do things like this. That's why we have studies like this. I'm thankful that we have it on Thursday nights and you're hearing from different people. Um, but I'm thankful for this um, David McLeod and the, um, the, the study and the, and the um, preparation that he's put into it. But um, this is the word of God. So whether it's a hard part of scripture, whether it's an easy part of scripture, it's there for us to learn from. It's there for us to grow from. So um, as we've discussed, the book of Hebrews is really, a, um, I don't know if you can look at it as a persuasive letter. Um, as some say, I, I think we talked about it, that it was maybe written to be like a sermon uh, presented. It, it's basically this persuasive um, presentation. And actually, this past week, we were talking with Brooklyn in her homeschooling about persuasion. And she had to think of, you know, some sentences that would convince me of something, persuade me of something. So I just looked up a simple definition of what it means to persuade. And, and that is to cause someone to believe something, especially after a sustained effort, or to convince through reason or argument. And so we can certainly say the book of Hebrews is a very sustained effort. It's, it's a pretty lengthy book, and it gets deep into a lot of the reasons why Christ is superior. And so we're, the author continues that, um, moving into um, chapter 8, that Christ is superior. So he's superior to, and we, we've looked at this already, the Old Testament prophets, superior to the angels, he's superior to Moses, he's superior to Aaron in terms of the person of Aaron, and he's superior to Aaron in terms of his function, in terms of his ministry and his service. So um, if you don't mind, we'll read through chapter 8. It's not too lengthy of a chapter, and then we'll move forward. Hebrews chapter 8, starting at verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, quoting from Jeremiah 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall not teach each and they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of the new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So pretty strong words. I think some pretty clear words, but some of it also that, that could be a little tricky. Um, so we'll jump right into it. Looking back at the end of Hebrews chapter 7, the author is presenting about this need that we have for a high priest, that we need a high priest who is holy, innocent, unstained, unstained separate from sinners. We need a high priest who does not need to offer sins, offer sacrifices for his own sins first. We need a high priest that is perfect and one that is perfect forever. So he's saying there's this great need at the end of chapter seven. 
And then we look at the first, that, that's from Hebrews 7. We look at the first few verses of Hebrews chapter 8, and he says, well, we have this priest. Now, the point in what we are saying is this, we have such a high priest. And, and then he goes on to describe this high priest, referring to Jesus Christ, sits at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven. So we're going to break down those words a little bit. This high priest, Jesus Christ, ministers in the holy places. Some versions could translate it the holy of holies. Uh, the true tent of the Lord, which is in heaven itself, the true tent. And then we have a high priest that is set up by the Lord, not by man. It's not an institution of man that could be made into traditions and rituals, but this is set up by the Lord completely, not set up by man. And those are the first few verses of Hebrews chapter 8. I, I might just mention, uh, depending on who you talk to, I, I was reading some other um, commentators, and that first phrase in chapter 8 says, now the point in what we are saying is this. Many believe that that's actually, he's talking about the whole book up to this point, seven chapters. Now, the point at what we're getting at, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, and others might disagree and say, no, this is more for a, a, a smaller you know, um, section of this book. But um, many believe that the point of what we are saying is this. So it's almost like, okay, we've reached this this person, Jesus Christ, we're going we're gonna to break it down even more, but this is what we've been trying to explain to you this whole time. This is what we've been getting at. So he mentions this about sitting at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. So we won't spend too much time on this, but what does the right hand represent in scripture? It, it can represent a, a number of things, uh, but there's some references here. And again, for the sake of time, we won't read through all of them, but the right hand is a place of honor. It's a place of power a place of salvation, a place of redemption, and the right hand is a place of justice. And we look at Christ, not just who he is, but what he accomplished as our perfect sacrifice and what he accomplishes as our great high priest. He's sitting at the right hand of God and he accomplishes these things for us. He's in that position because he fulfills each of these um, duties, if I could say it that way. But then we're also told that he's seated he has taken his seat, Nasby says. He has taken his seat. So what does this mean? Uh, I think it has already been mentioned in previous uh, weeks. There's no chairs in the tabernacle. There was no place for the high priest to sit. The Old Testament priests, they were always standing because why? Because their job was never done. We're going to read about this in Hebrews 10 as well. Their job was never done. But what are we told about Christ? He has taken his seat. Why? And, and most, if not all commentators agree because the work is completed. It makes sense. The high priest never sat down in the tabernacle. There was no place for them to sit down. Christ, we're told, is seated. The work is completed. And that's confirmed, Hebrews 1.3 and Hebrews 10.12. Another thing we're told, the beginning of verse 2, it tells us that he's a minister in the holy places. So what is he doing as our minister? And I think this is something we could, we could name a, a bunch of different things, but just to, to pull out a few points, his work is completed, so his sacrificial work is completed, but he continues to make intercession for us. If you go back to chapter 7, verse 25, it tells us, consequently, or just the end of that phrase, he always lives to make intercession for them. I don't know about you, but that's reassuring to me. This isn't something that happened, you know, thousands of years ago, and we just, you know, it, it, it's done. And yes, the work of salvation is complete. But Christ is alive, and he's still at work today on our behalf. We're going to talk about how he serves as our mediator. Because we continue to sin. We continue to fall short. And we've been positionally cleansed. We've been, we've been positionally um, sanctified because of his work on the cross. But then he continues to make intercession for us. I, I think it's a beautiful thought that I know I don't spend enough time thinking about. I don't spend enough time thanking him uh, for that ministry that he continues to today. And they were also told that it's in the true tent. I, I mentioned it already. Uh, that can be translated holy places or holy of holies. Uh, so when, when the author is talking about this true tent, it's not the earthly tabernacle, tabernacle that was set up for the nation of Israel. It's not the earthly tabernacle that Moses was given the blueprints for. And a beautiful building, a beautiful tabernacle. But Christ is in an even better place. He's in the true tent. Not this copy, but he's in the real deal. He's in the real place in heaven before God, making intercession for us. That's his ministry. 
And then we get into this idea of the high priest. Remember, we said Christ is superior to the person of Aaron, who was the high priest, but also to the functions of the high priest. So there were general functions of the high priest, and that was basically to offer gifts and sacrifices. And we're told that in verse 3, to offer gifts and sacrifices. So Christ, as our high priest, uh, he, he also had to offer something. He must also have something to, to offer at the end of verse 3, three we're told that. And um, what did he offer? Well, we all know he offered himself, the perfect lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice. His sacrifice was by his own blood, and it was once and for all. Hebrews 9.12, the next week we're going to talk about that. His sacrifice was once and for all. It's an amazing thing when we think about it. And again, we're going to talk about this copy and shadow of things to come. It, it was never enough. The sacrifices that were offered with the old priesthood in the old sanctuary was never enough to, um, to, to remove sins. It, it was never enough to completely cover sins. They had to be offered time and time again, year after year. But Christ was once and for all. And one thing that um, I, I know um, others have mentioned, and uh, the author in, in our book that we're going through uh, doesn't mention it or doesn't make as, I guess, as much of a focus on it. But I, I was listening to one preacher covering this chapter, and they said the people back then, I, I think it's hard for us to grasp how important the tabernacle was, or, or in this case, how important the temple was. It was a beautiful building. This is where God was. This was God's presence. The tabernacle and the work of the priest was such an elevated position. It, it, it was such a respected position in the nation of Israel. And for good reason. We, I, I don't want to discredit that. But the author of Hebrews is saying, okay, you have this thing and you're really holding on to it. And yes, it's a good thing, but there's something so much better. But but the, the people that he's writing to were so caught up in, in the, the temple and the work of the priests. And, and, and these were all good things and they were given by God, but it was only pointing to an even better thing. I, I, I think of, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but I, I can't remember, we were having dinner with the kids and there was some dessert that we had never had before. And Lisa brought it to the table and we said, girls, you got to try this dessert. No, 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 we don't want it. We want a cookie or we want, you know, something that they've had before. They knew the cookie was good. And I, I don't mean to be disrespectful with this, um, with this picture, but it, it just, it's the mindset that the children had. It was, well, we know what this is. We know what that dessert that we've had over and over and over again. And we just enjoy it so much. We're not willing to let it go. We finally convinced the girls, hey, like this is different. You might not have seen it before, but take this. You're going to love it. And sure enough, they had it and, and they enjoyed it and they were, they were hooked on it. The writer of Hebrews is trying to persuade people that are set in their minds to say, no, the old priesthood is better. No, the tabernacle, the temple, that's where it's at. We're, we're holding on to that rather than letting go of that and say, hey, there's something so much better. So the author continues this through the, through the uh, Hebrews chapter 8. And so he compares, uh, really through the rest of this chapter, the difference between the old and the new priesthoods. And he doesn't mention all of them, but he, he covers a lot here. Christ was not a priest according to the law. The end of verse four, that phrase, according to the law. Well, what did he mean by that? He meant that it wasn't from uh, the tribe of Levi. Aaron was according to the law, right? He, he was from the line of Levi, but Christ was from the line of uh, Judah, right? So according to the law, Christ could not be a high priest. And it's not according to an earthly priesthood. As I mentioned, he serves in heaven. He serves in the true tent. Uh, the nation of Israel, the, the, the Hebrews that the author is writing to says, you already have the earthly priesthood. And, and we've already seen it's not good enough. We have a better high priest and he serves in a better tent. And that is Christ. So then he goes on to explain that the Le Levitical priesthood and the tabernacle in verse five, they're just a shadow of a better covenant. They're just pointing so, and I think of shadow, I think of maybe you have a silhouette of a person. And okay, like, uh, yeah, that's it, it's nice. It's the outline of a person. Okay, great. But then you don't have an actual picture that shows all the details and the beauty and the, you know, the facial features and all. It's just a shadow. It's a picture of something that's so much more beautiful. And verse five, the author makes it very clear. 
the, the Levitical priesthood, the tabernacle, they can't live up. They can't even come close to what uh, Christ is, um, to, to who Christ is as our high priest. And then we're told in verse six, Christ obtained. And this, the language in this, and, and even the some of the wording in it, in it um, I admit, is a little challenging for me, but um, I just put it kind of in the shape of a pyramid here. It says he had a better ministry because it was based on a better covenant, because it was based on a better promise. And this we could talk about all day, but but just to mention um, the better ministry, uh, Christ always lives to make intercession for us, right? So that's a better ministry than what the the uh, priests of the nation of Israel historically could do. They, they couldn't do it forever. They're by nature of their physical lives. They didn't live forever. They had to be replaced. Well, Christ lives forever. He will never have to be replaced. And it's based on a better covenant. Verses 8 through 13, we're going to look at that, the comparison of the two covenants. And because it's based on a better promise. And I think of Hebrews chapter 6. I don't know if you remember the end, the last eight verses of Hebrews chapter 6, where they talk about the promise of God. Um, the, the phrase is, the unchangeable character of his purpose. And it talks about God making a promise and God making an oath. And it stands on what God has promised. So it's better. And we're told Christ is a mediator. If we keep looking through verse six, let me just make sure I believe it's, yeah, he mediates. The covenant that he mediates is better. So the author, uh, McLeod, spends some time on this, this idea of mediator. Moses served as a mediator. Jesus currently serves as our mediator, 1 Timothy 2, 5. And the one word that stood out, arbitrator, I, I, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, but I, you may have heard the time I hear that is when there's an athlete who thinks, well, hey, I'm not being paid enough. My contract is not paying me enough. But then the team says, no, this is the contract and this is what you deserve. And so they call it an arbitration case. Basically, somebody comes in and tries to work an agreement between the two. They settle the dispute. So the arbitrator, Jesus comes in as the arbitrator, one who protects the interests of both parties. Well, here's a holy God who needs to punish sin, who needs, who needs to take care of sin. He can't ignore it. He's a holy God. And then here's a sinful people who have no possible way. We have no possible way of paying for those sins. So Christ comes in. He's the one who protects the interest of what needs to be done from the Father's perspective, but also out of love for us, he does what's needed to bring forgiveness and to bring righteousness. He settles that dispute between a holy God and sinful man. So I, I just love this picture of Christ as the mediator. Now, a better covenant, verses 7 through 13. This is a quote from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. And the uh, McLeod spends some time talking about covenant. And for the sake of time, uh, we won't get too deep into it. But um, but I, I like what he brought out. So I actually looked at it. I looked up the, the original words, you know, in Hebrew for Jeremiah and then Greek uh, for, for the book of Hebrews. But uh, a covenant is basically a binding settlement, compact agreement, contract. Jeremiah 31, 32, the original, the word is berith. Again, I'm probably saying that wrong but it's an alliance, a treaty, an agreement. But it's always used in the sense of a conditional covenant. So it's an agreement between two parties that make an agreement that say, okay, I'll hold my part of the bargain, you hold your part of the bargain. It's a conditional covenant. But then McLeod mentions in Hebrews 8, 6, and 7, the word, it's a Greek word, it's a set agreement having complete terms determined by the initiating party which also are fully affirmed by the one entering the agreement. So there's an initiating party that has more power. They, they're the ones who kind of lay out the terms. And obviously this is God in this case for, for the better covenant. It's initiated by God. So I just kind of like, you know, that's a, that's a little aside, but I just kind of like to, to think about that um, where uh, God is initiating this. It's Our salvation is impossible without God. That's something we'd be thankful for. If it depended on us, if it depended on us holding up our end of the bargain, we'd fail miserably. I, I, I can't remember the verse, but Romans chapter 4, where it talks about um, because of faith, we can be sure of this salvation. And that's, that, that is, a, a, um, what's the word? That's my version of it. But basically, it's because it is by faith. Our salvation is by faith, so we can be sure of it. If it was by works, we can't be sure of it because we'd fail miserably time and time again. So Christ lives forever to make intercession for us. 
So again, comparing the covenants, the old and the new covenants did share this thing. They were both instituted by blood. We're going to talk about that next week. But the new is better because the mediator is better. It's already been established that Christ is better than Moses. Christ is better than Aaron. We talked about that last week, looking at Melchizedek, right? Melchizedek was from a priesthood, a line that was better than the Levitical priesthood. And Craig went into detail with that. But the new covenant is better because the mediator, Jesus Christ, God himself, is better. And this is a quote from the book on page 125. The first covenant failed to achieve access to God and forgiveness of sins for the people. The new covenant or a new covenant was therefore needed. The one word that stood out, and I don't have this in my notes, but in verse 7 where it says, for if that first covenant had been faultless, and I didn't really look into the original word there, but to think about that, oh, like, did the first covenant had fault? Was there something wrong with it? Um, and, and, and I don't know if I can be so bold as to go and say, well, there's something wrong with it. But the idea that the author is pointing out here, it's not enough. It's just a picture of something greater, something that God knew had to happen down the road. This shadow and this copy just points us to that better. So that word faultless, again, I didn't really look into it, but it's saying, well, it just wasn't enough. I looked at this. I, I don't know if this example is going to make sense, but there's beta versions. Before software comes out, there's a beta version so that people can use it. They can work out some of the kinks before they come out with the final version. And so it's not that there's anything wrong with the beta version. It's still serving the function. It's still serving the purpose of what that software, what, what it's meant to, what it was created to accomplish, but it's not the final thing. It's not the final product. It's not the complete final version of what they have. So I don't know if that's a good example or not, but, um, but we're told in verse seven, that first covenant had some fault to it. Feel free to talk to me after if you, uh, if you want to uh, disagree. So the need for the new covenant. So, so there was something not quite right. There's, there was something that wasn't complete about the old covenant. So there is a need for the new covenant. The old covenant did reveal man's sin and inability. The old covenant, it did not give sinners a new nature. So we have this new covenant and it provides full forgiveness, provides full pardon from sin. And then the, during the time of Jeremiah, so this quote from Jeremiah 31 God promises the new covenant during that time because Israel did not continue in God's covenant, we're told in verse 9. And we can read through the nation of Israel, the history of Israel. They're people just like us. And we will make a promise to God and we'll say, yes, God, we love you. We, uh, and, and we fall short and we fall short. And God knows this. This is part of our human nature. That's why we needed a better, a new covenant, a better priesthood. And that's why he sent Christ. So what are some of the provisions of this new covenant? This, there's a little more detail than what I have on the slides, but um, again, this is pretty much from what McLeod was sharing. There's four provisions. The first is this internal inclination to obey. We already read uh, in verse, verse 10 about the law written in the minds and on the hearts of the people. It, it brings to mind Ezekiel 36, where he says that the heart of stone will be replaced with a heart of flesh. So it's not just this external law that we have to try to, you know, meet the demands of. There's this internal inclination, this desire to obey. It's a love relationship. It's not just a, I, I, I got to, you know, I got to meet the standard and I'm never going to meet it. It's a love relationship because Christ gave all for us. So this internal inclination to obey. And then this unconditional relationship with God. It's a covenant of grace. So I didn't, I didn't include it here, but in the book, he says, I, I love, he just goes down this list. Verses 8 through 12, God says, I will establish, I made, I will put, I will write, I will be, I will remember their iniquities no more. I will remember their sins no more. So this is all, again, God initiating this agreement. And I'm, I'm so thankful he initiated it. Again, we just need to accept it by faith. What a wonderful truth that we have in the gospel. But it's an unconditional relationship to God because God made that possible, because he did it. And then the third point, the third provision of the new covenant and how it's different from the old, there's a personal knowledge of God. There's no privileged class of mediators. There's no, um, like the Levitical priestly line, you had to go to the high priest. You had to go to the priests to, to make things right between you and God. 
Well, Christ is that high priest. Now we can go straight to God himself because we have that mediator. We have that arbitrator, Jesus Christ. There's access to God for all people, for all believers. In verse 11, he says, um, they shall all know me. And again, I don't know the original language, but it, it has this idea of a personal relationship with God. We have access to God. And other parts of Hebrews tell us that. We have boldness to enter into his presence because of Christ. We don't have to fear and go through another person. We have Christ, this personal knowledge of God. And then lastly, the last provision of the new covenant that's different from the old, there's merciful forgiveness of sins. There's complete forgiveness of sins. It makes the new covenant superior to the old. One more slide, and then we'll end this time here, but the finality of the new covenant. So pretty much out with the old, in with the new. Jeremiah 31 uh, 31 to 34, it shows, at least that Jeremiah, but I imagine some of the other prophets even knew that the old covenant just wasn't cutting it, that the old covenant would come to an end. And you read this passage from Jeremiah, and it's very clear. God says, this, this isn't quite what you need. You need something more. And if there's any doubt in the reader's mind, he, he uses the last verse to make it clear. Stop holding on to this thing that you know, this thing that you think is better and look, open your eyes. I, I'm, I'm presenting this sustained argument, this, this rational argument uh, to convince you there's something better. And he says that the old covenant was becoming obsolete. It was growing old and it was vanishing away. So it's, it, it's something he's, he's not um, leaving any doubt with his readers. He's making it very clear. Jeremiah made it clear back in the, back in the day when, um, when he was a prophet for the nation of Israel. And the writer of Hebrews is making it clear, saying there is something better, and that is Jesus Christ. Let's close this time in prayer, and then we'll spend uh, some of the rest of our night uh, in prayer. God, our Father, we thank you for uh, this opportunity to to come together, to to look into Hebrews. And as we talked, uh, it's not an easy book. It's very challenging. Um, Even references to the Old Testament to try to understand uh, just how important that that uh, priesthood, how, how important that um, the system was, how important the tabernacle was, how, how crucial the temple was in, in the in the everyday life uh, of the nation of Israel, and in the everyday life of the readers of, of this letter or this book uh, to the Hebrews. Um, Father, I'm thankful that we do have a new covenant. We do have a better priest. That we have the person of Jesus Christ, perfect who did not, who never has to offer up sacrifices for his own sins first, Um, but he can go and stand before you, offering himself, the perfect lamb of God, and serving as the holy, the perfect high priest uh, to this day, continuing forever, making intercession for us. We thank you that there is something better. Help us, even though we don't have that same experience, that same mindset as these early uh, Jewish believers, as the early um, Jewish people, Help us to appreciate it, that what we have is so much better than, than, what, than, than what everyone had in the past. What we, um, what we have is, is so much greater. And Father, not that we can just enjoy it and sit back and appreciate it, but Father, that we might share that with other believers and encourage each other with these words from Hebrews, with this message from Hebrews, um, that we have such a high priest. We have it. We needed it and we have him. Um, but Father, help us also to reach out to others. This world, we're all sinners, and this world is lost, and, and people need to know that there is someone who desires to make intercession for them. There's someone who gave his life, who shed his blood. Um, so, so give us that burden to share about this better priesthood that's offered to everyone. Doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter your current situation. Christ is the great high priest, and he's superior to all of these things. As we continue through the book of Hebrews, just help us to recognize that and be thankful for that. We, we give thanks and we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.